Hey guys, it's Alex Torelli. Welcome back to an episode at the hand of the day. I first wanted to say thank you to everyone who supported me at the 8 at 8 event in Barcelona. We went deep in the main, we got close to cashing. I gave away 10% of myself. I was trying to boost someone's bankroll and make a few of you guys rich, but sorry we didn't do it. And I'm really bummed. I really wanted to do it for you guys as much as I did for me. I really appreciate all your support. I felt a ton of positive energy coming from uh, you guys on Instagram as well as on Facebook. For everyone that joined my competition and sent me messages, I read all of them. I tried to respond to all you guys uh, as well while I was playing um, and I really, really appreciate it. It means a lot to me and I will be doing more of these giveaways in the future in big events I play. So be sure to stay tuned to my Instagram where I'm probably going to do a lot of them at Alec Torelli uh, as well as Twitter, Facebook at Alec Torelli as well. I'm also going to be doing one exclusively for my newsletter subscribers sometime in the future on alectorelli.com. Uh, if you haven't already, so check out my newsletter, Crush Mondays. Every Monday you'll get an awesome piece of content from me reviewing some poker tips uh, and strategies and insights that I only share with readers as well. And of course, a chance to have uh, access to some of my giveaways too. So I just want to thank you guys so much. That was amazing. And quick announcement as well. I'm going to be going to India today. I just got invited to go to the Poker League there. It's the inaugural event. It's the first time they've launched this. Poker has just sort of become regulated in India. And apparently it's a huge event, a huge deal. I'm so excited to be going. I got invited at literally 1 a.m. two nights ago, and I'm in Barcelona right now. I'm going to Milan to meet my wife, who's in Italy, and then we're flying to Goa uh, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So I have a crazy schedule. I just moved mountains around to get there, uh, and I'm really, really excited. So be sure to stay tuned to my Instagram. I'll be posting a lot of stuff on Instagram stories, as well as um, content on my Instagram about hands I play, exciting aspects of the event. I will try to release a little bit more content about me on the ground while I'm at these events and just showcase a little bit more about the lifestyle of a poker player and just some of the cool things I get to be a part of. So this event I'm super excited about. I'm super flattered to be invited and to be going and to be part of the launch of poker in India, which I know is a huge market. I've always wanted to visit India. It's like super high on my bucket list. My 43rd country, my sixth this year. Fuck, this is amazing. Like the coolest thing about being a poker player is having control of your time and being able to just travel and go to events on a whim like this and make my own schedule. And I've been doing this 14 years. Uh, I've been traveling full time for 12. I'm 30 now, it's crazy. Uh, and honestly, like this never gets old. Like this shit gets me fired up. Like the most exciting thing is getting a text message from this guy, I have no idea who he is at 1 a.m. that I almost didn't read on my Facebook, but luckily I read all my messages and he's like, hey, you wanna come to India? And I was like, what the hell, this is so random, so sketch, right? Like you wanna come to India tomorrow and play in this poker event? I'm like, um, okay. Next thing you know, we're on Skype. This guy's super cool, super legit, tells me about the event. I look it up, I'm like, oh my God, this is real deal. I'm going, I'm gonna be a featured player. Apparently it's a huge deal. I will keep you guys posted. Stay tuned to my Instagram and a lot of stories and updates coming. So really exciting stuff. I'm fired up and I will show a lot more of my poker content. Uh, leave me a comment below on this video too. Let me know more of this type of stuff you guys would like to see. If you'd like to see more of the lifestyle stuff on the ground, um, I think I'm gonna be showcasing a lot more of that in the future. Anyway, I would also like to cover a hand of the day that I played during the 888 main event in Barcelona as well. I will be posting more of these hands that I played on my Instagram at Alec Torelli. Um, so I'll be posting a lot more of these hands there. So it's not just like saturating this channel with hand replayers of hand of the days from this event. But I did write down every single hand that I played from the 888 main event in Barcelona. And I wanna showcase those hands on my Instagram to kind of just go through like the entire process of a tournament. I thought that would be a cool way to share content with you guys where it's like, hey look, this is my tournament start to finish about every single hand I played and some of the thoughts I'm going through in a hand. So I'm announcing that now, I'm gonna try and do it, I'm gonna try and stick with it. Uh, if it gets traction and you guys like it if, it, if it gets traction on my Instagram and I see positive feedback, I will keep it up and try and go through my entire tournament. Hand of the day. This hand kicks off very beginning of the tournament. This is the first hand I played. It's the first hand I wrote down in my little phone. A lot of people ask me how I record content and how I memorize hands, how I write down hands, how I study hands. It's all right here. So if you look at my phone, this is my little iPhone 7. You can't see the friggin' notepad, which sucks because the screen's too bright. But basically it's a notepad and I just write down like exactly how I play the hand. So I write number one, 50, 100, late position raises to 250, cutoff calls, I make it 10, 1,050 in the big blind with ace, king of spades. The original raiser folds and the caller calls. That's exactly what I write down. Then I just write down all the strategy. So let's get to the hand. As you saw pre-flop, 
Late position raises to 250. The cutoff calls 250. 1500, no annies. I make it 1050 in the big blind with ace king of spades. Now I could have made it maybe a little bit bigger here, but without antes, I don't think you have to go too big here. And in the big blind, generally when people three bet, their hand range is a little bit stronger, a little bit perhaps unbalanced here. I feel like I would three bet some bluffs here um, because I definitely want to have a balanced range in the big blind. I don't want my range to only be like nut in hands, three betting in the big line. So I think three betting a balance range here is totally fine. I think 1,050 is a pretty good size. You're out of position, two players, no antes. If there were antes, probably go a little bit bigger. Anyway, I make it 1,050. The original razor folds, and now the caller opts to just call. So automatically right here, I'm thinking he has a hand that's going to play pretty well post-flop. He probably is not gonna have like an offsuit hand, like ace-jack offsuit, not just because I block that hand with one of my aces, but just because those hands generally, A, don't call raises pre-flop, and B, they don't call three bets. So it's important to understand here what his range is. His range is gonna be something that plays well against my strong range. So he's gonna have hands that are like suited, that play well, like eight, seven suited, and he's gonna have a lot of pairs that are looking to flop sets in position with a 30K starting stack. Flop comes king five five, which is a great flop for me. King of diamonds, five of clubs, five of hearts, and I have ace king of spades. So it's very unlikely that my opponent has me beat at this point because if he had ace five, then he only has one combination of ace five suited that beats me. I have the ace of spades. So the only ace five suited combo that beats me is ace five of diamonds, okay? So there's one ace five combo, he could have five, six suited. He could have five, four suited. I think that's really it. So there's three hands that beat me, maybe four hands if he has pocket fives for quads. Everything else I beat. So this is a great spot for me because obviously it's like super likely I have the nuts, but more importantly than that, it's also a great spot for me because my hand range is so much stronger than my opponent's hand range. This flop is way better for me than it is for my opponent. I can have ace king, I can have kings, I can have aces. He can't have any of those hands. So this is a great spot to bet. I bet 1300, which is about half the pot, about half the pot. I could even bet like 800 here, just because my range is so much stronger than his and a lot of my range is weak. Not, not a lot of my range is weak, but a lot of my range isn't aces, kings, and ace king, which are really the, or king queen, which are really the hands I'm betting for value. Um, so I wanna give myself a good price on my bluffs. I also don't really have to be worried about anything on this board. Uh, there's not that many hands my opponent can continue with. So I could even go a little bit smaller, but given how deep we are, I decided to bet 1300 and he opts to just call. Turn comes a six of spades, um, making the board completely rainbow. And here's really where the hand sort of goes on a fork in the road. I'm either going to decide, you know what, I'm gonna bet three streets and try and get value for three streets, bet you know 3,500 on the turn, 9,000 on the river, something like that, and just go bet, bet, bet with my ace king. Or I'm gonna check if he's floating me a lot and try and you know pick off a bluff, let him bet. Or just, I don't think that he's gonna call three streets with that many worse hands than me, because there's not that, like I just don't think he has that many worse like king X types hands. And so, I'm just gonna check the turn and try and get value on the river. So it's not about the idea that my hand isn't strong enough to bet three streets. It's just like, how do I get the most value from this hand? I decided to check the turn. I just didn't feel like he was gonna call me down super light in this particular spot. I felt like it looked like my hand was really strong and he's probably gonna fold something like king 10 on the river if I just go bet, bet, bet. Bottom line, I just didn't think I was gonna get that much value. So I decided to check the turn, maybe play pot control. Maybe he's floating me and maybe he's gonna bluff, I'm gonna get some more value that way. But more importantly, I'm just gonna go check, check, turn, and then I'm gonna bet the river, and I think he's gonna call me very, very often in that spot. So I just thought I was gonna get the most value by checking. I check, he checks behind, which I was expecting him to do a lot of the time with his weak sort of bluff catchers, maybe like pocket eights. Um, maybe even a weak king is gonna check here as well. Um, maybe ace high, something like that. River comes a jack of hearts. I bet 3,600. I wanna bet a big sizing here because I'm basically repping a king or a bluff, right? I'm not gonna, I mean, maybe queens, but when I bet really big here, it sort of polarizes my range even more. It's basically like saying I have jacks full, you know, king, queen or better, or I'm bluffing. And I think it makes my hand look a little bit more fishy because he's probably gonna think, well, if this guy had aces or ace king, why wouldn't he just bet the turn? So I think this makes my hand look really, really fishy, which I really like. And I think it's very likely he's gonna hero me, even if he has something like pocket eights, uh, I think it's a great spot for me. 
I bet 3,600. Now he makes it 10,000. And I'm like, wait a minute, what the hell is going on here? How can I get raised on this river? Let's rethink this hand. Like, he called the flop. He called the three river pre-flop. He called the flop. He checks the turn and now he's raising the river. So I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, I guess he could have slow played a five, but that doesn't really make sense to me. Like, why would, first of all, there's not that many fives he could have. We already said there's pretty much four combos. Um, but it doesn't make any sense to check behind the turn with those hands because you want to build a huge pot, right? If I have something like ace king or queens or a king or whatever, you win so much more money by betting the turn, betting something like three or 4,000 on the turn and 10,000, 12,000 on the river than you do by checking the turn and then hoping I bet. So it just doesn't make any sense to check this turn with a five to me or six is full. Makes absolutely no sense to check this turn. I think betting is far superior. So I don't understand how he could have a hand that beats me. Maybe he, could, he can't really have jacks full either because he would have three bet preflop with that hand against the original opener, I believe. I, I'm almost sure he would have done it based on who this type of player is. Even though I hadn't played that much with him, it just looked like the guy that would have three bet jacks. So I guess he could have king jack, but there's only one combination of king jack because I have the king of spades, the king of diamonds is on the board and the jack of hearts is on the board. So he really has to have king jack of diamonds and he has to be value raising that hand, which a lot of people won't do. They might just call scared that I have a boat or aces or trips or something like that. Some people will value raise it, but there's only one combo of it. And some people won't even value raise it all the time. So I'm like, dude, what the hell does this guy have here? This doesn't make any sense. It also doesn't make any sense for him to be bluffing just because it's such a ridiculous spot to bluff. Like it looks so silly that why would he be bluffing? In the end, I had no idea what to do. I didn't know anything about this guy. Nothing made sense to me. Value hands didn't make sense. Bluffs didn't make sense. And I had to make a decision. I was getting a pretty good price. I didn't really know what to do. In the end, I just said to myself, you know what, it's a 1K, it's a rebuy. Most importantly, it's a rebuy. So if I lose this hand and I end up busting, I'm just gonna rebuy anyway. It's a tough spot. It's not like I'm just calling with no equity, like thinking I have like no chance of winning because I don't care about money. But in the end, knowing that it was a rebuy made me much more comfortable in calling because at the end of the day, I'm playing to get first place. I'm playing to at least get top three in an event like this. And I wanna make a lot of money for you guys that have 10%. I wanna to get to the final table, that's why I'm playing. And so, you know what, I was like, screw it, I'm gonna call. I called, he turned over quads, which I guess makes sense. I guess that's the one hand that makes sense. Um, even though I still would bet quads on the turn. Why didn't he bet the turn? Anyway, I would've lost more money if you bet the turn anyway. So I guess I'm happy about this hand, um, other than the fact I lost. So anyway, this is the first hand in my entire tournament. I will try to review more of these. Let me know your thoughts in the comment below about a bunch of shit with this video. Um, this was kind of a hybrid video. I wanted to give you guys a quick update. I'm in my hotel room. It's 2.05, I have to check out at three. This was really all I had time for, but I wanna give you a quick update. I'm going to India. Stay tuned on social media. I will see you guys later. Peace, thanks for watching.